Good evening and welcome to the Murfreesboro City Board of Education meeting. I will call on now uh, Principal Greg Lyles to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance and will stand for a moment of silence. If I could now have a motion for the approval of our agenda. Second. It's been moved and second that our, we approve our agenda. All in favor, sign of aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Ms. Mathis, communications. Yes, Ms. Wade, did you wish to reorder the agenda by moving the school reports before our action items? Yes, ma'am. I would like to because I see that we have a guest in our audience tonight and yes ma'am I would like to do that thank you just a few short communications for you all tonight reminding you that TCAP week in Murfreesboro City Schools will be April 13 through 17 and during that week we'll provide bottled water and breakfast free to every child a little update for you for some of the things going on at Hopgood. Their students have raised $215 for the Pennies for Peace program, $964 for Jump Broke for Heart, and the school will receive an additional $3,100 for their Fresh Fruit and Vegetable program. And if you all haven't had a chance to go out and see that in operation, I would invite you to do so. Bradley, an update for you on them. Their fifth grade trip to Memphis has been sponsored by Doug Hughes of TRX Alliance. This is a tax, fund, uh, a tax refund express. He has donated $5,600, and then the teachers have raised $3,300. I know this will be a memorable time for our fifth graders going to Memphis. Mitchell Nielsen Primary has received $8,500 from State Farm's Good Neighbor Grant Program. And the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee has made field trip money available to three of our schools, Hobgood, John Pittard, and Mitchell Nielsen Primary. Scales Elementary has received grants of $750 from Verizon and also a $500 award from State Farm. Case and Lane has received $900 from the Great Smoky Mountains Institute for their sixth graders. And something you're going to be learning quite a bit more about later, a $27,390 grant from the State Farm Youth Advisory Board. Uh, Tina Bailey, a teacher at Case and Lane, has written that for that grant. There will be a groundbreaking for an outdoor learning center. I know all of you will be invited, and we will bring you a uh, more lengthy update on that later. Wanted to let you know that we have a number of daughters of the American Revolution first place winners. We've had a number of winners, but I'm only bringing you to you tonight our first place winners. Discovery School, sixth grader Marilyn Kelly, Nathan Seeger, Asaf Asfa Mohammed, and Sarah Addison Smith are all students at uh, Discovery School who won first place. And then at Scales, we had a first grader win first place, Emma Barch, and one person who's not on here, a John Pittard Elementary student who won first place, Barat Eric. And these students will now go on to compete in Southeast Regional Competition. We want to congratulate a teacher, third grade teacher at the Discovery School, Teresa McCarthy, has recently been named Teacher of the Month by the radio station WKDF. And a thanks to one of our board members, Nancy Duggan, has purchased bookmarks for all of our students uh, in support of Read to Succeed's Literacy Matters. And one other item on the back, you'll see that um, we do have our first budget sessions planned for um, March 31st at 6 p.m. We still have a lot of information that we need before we can bring you any type of a, a budget. As you all know, the stimulus money 
Uh, the decision has not been made as to how that money will be used by school systems. The governor has not yet taken his budget to the uh, state legislature. So there is some possibility that we may have to delay that meeting until the date that we've set in April. And also next month, I want you all to know that uh, we will be bringing you a complete update of the two fabulous functions sponsored by the uh, City Schools Foundation, our celebration last Friday night, and then also our fashion show. And I want to just stop and commend Cheryl Harris for the fabulous job she did in making that uh, excellent celebration such, such success. And we will certainly be having her take a bow before the camera next month. We wanted to wait until we had full information on the financial results of those two events. So Chairman Wade, Chair Lady Wade, those are all the items of communication tonight. All right, Ms. Mathis, is it okay? Right. Well, let's go ahead and get the uh, consent items done, and then right after that okay. uh, we'll go ahead and move the reports up. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to, for the consent items? Move we approve the consent items. Is there a second? second. Ms. Wade, I have a question on one of the items. For the negotiation team, are we, the negotiation team for, uh, do they negotiate for the board? Uh, and the reason I'm asking, we. Do we need to remove that from the consent agenda? Yes. If Is there a motion to remove it, it and we'll bring it down in discussion items if you'd okay. like to. Can we, can we move it to the consent it. agenda? I mean the uh, action items. Okay. Is there a motion to? Do we need a motion on that? Yes. Is there a motion? Uh, Dr. Bertram, do you have a motion where you'd like to move it to the action items? And that's where I'd need to move it, just ask a question? Well, yes. So either we can move it down here under uh, reports and information and we can talk about it at that time. It, it would need to be removed to the action items since it will require a vote. Okay. But we already have a motion and a second on the floor for the consent agenda. So if you would Listen. want to withdraw those in. Can I get the motion withdrawn? Well. Mrs. Baker, I'll have to ask this question to you. Okay. If the person that makes the motion has no desire to withdraw their motion, has been a second, do we have to continue to vote and call the roll? You can vote on the motion that's on the table, and then um, we need to move with the initial motion that is on the table. All righty. Ms. Ridley, call the roll. May, may I ask a question? Yes. Can I? Just for question. Under what procedure do we have to move this? Do we have to vote on on this? To vote on the consent agenda? Well, I understand there's a motion for the consent agenda. <coughs> if you want well, to... Why do we have to have a motion, I guess, to move what Dr. Buttram is asking to the action items? If a board member wants to remove something from the consent agenda, then they make that request. I don't want to remove it. I wanted to ask a question. Ask a question. That it, the consent agenda is set up so that there's no discussion. It's just yes or no, and if you want to remove something from it, there's an allowance to do that. That's what the consent agenda is. There's no discussion. You don't talk about it. I mean, that's just what it is. What a is that board policy? Is. That's just what a consent agenda is. On is that board, board policy? We don't follow Robert Rules of Order, so we can do it the way we want to. And that's Ms. Baker, for clarification. There's a motion on the floor. They did not rescind the motion. We have to vote on the motion on the floor. I'll, I'll go true? ahead and rescind it. That's okay. okay. I'll rescind Alrighty. it. And then if, if somebody wants to, you know, vote on moving mm -hmm. it or – is, is it I – don't, I don't know, because we've never had it happen before. I, I don't know. Do you have to vote on moving something off the consent agenda, or does it automatically go off of it if somebody wants to? If it. someone wants to remove an item from the consent uh -huh. agenda, a board member would just need to make that request mm -hmm. and remove it off of the consent agenda okay. so it could be discussed and then voted on. Okay. If it's on the okay. consent agenda, like you said, it's not. Yeah, there's no discussion of okay. consent agenda. So, so if he wants to remove it, we just move it and then we'll talk about it there. Right. Okay. Dr. Bertram? 
Did you want I guess I need that? to make a motion to remove. No, we we'll just no, we'll just, just move, move it. Do you we'll want move to move to the action items for discussion? Yes, yes. All righty. Under now we're back to consent. Is there a motion? I move that, that we item? approve the minutes of the regularly scheduled board meeting of February twenty fourth, two thousand nine. Second. Second. There's been a motion and second. Let's really call the room. Okay. Doctor Bedroom. Yes. Mr. Campbell. Yes, ma'am. Miss Dougie. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Miss Phillips. Aye. Doctor Andrews. Aye. Miss Wade. Yes. Okay. Now we ready. do have two school reports tonight, and I am delighted to get to introduce those. I'm going to ask that we change the order of those just slightly, and have Scales Elementary Schools report go first. Principal Katrine Stevens, if you would please introduce your report to us, and welcome to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to share about Scales and what makes it a valuable part of Murfreesboro City Schools. Little did I know when I became a principal of Scales what an impact having a school named for such a prominent, amazing family would have on all of us. Mary Scales, one of our namesakes, is here this evening and I felt it very appropriate for her to share with you her thoughts about Scales. Thank you. Ms. Wade, members of the board, Ms. Mathis and staff, thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight to tell you that my heart cannot express the feeling I have for your naming this school, Skills Elementary. The young man for which you name in memory of, truly believed in education. He served on the city school uh, uh, council for 24 years, and his heart was education. He made sure that the money was appropriated for schools and other materials, and that the raises and things for teachers were because he felt that education is the key for a better world. And so, by you doing that, and he also went on to serve on the Tennessee Higher Education Commission to make sure that Middle Tennessee State University got its share of the appropriation. So his whole life has been centered around education. And so, and that other person name that you have, uh, his wife, <laughs> um, you gave me my start here in uh, Murfreesboro City School. That was my first job of teaching. And boy, it set the stage. Every place I went, I used example of what we did here in Murfreesboro City School. I had an opportunity to serve as a mathematics specialist for the state of Tennessee, traveling all over the state in different schools. And by doing that, when you walk in a school, all of these educators know, you get the feel of what's happening in that school. And let me tell you, when you walk in Scales Elementary School, you get that feeling. They're happy children, learning is taking place. Uh, we, we're just so excited. I sat where you are. I served on the Murfreesboro City School Board for eight years. And I do appreciate what you're doing because what you do affects everyone either directly or indirectly. So I'd like to thank you for the role that you're playing in helping children. Um, my husband, uh, it was just something about him. We're in the ambulance uh, funeral business. If there were a family and they had children, he made sure that they had shoes and coat to wear to the funeral. His heart was children. He would always say, Mary, but it's the children. It's about the children. And so, for you, I, I just, 
I know he knows what's happening down here. Uh, but it just, you made a great choice. Um, my heart also is still in education, and I do believe that that is the key for a better world. And Murfreesboro City School sets the stage. And they have a school, Scales Elementary. Uh, you have uh, a principal and, and teachers and staff, everybody. It, it's just a great, if you have not had an opportunity to visit that school, you'll get that feeling that I'm talking about when you, when you walk in. But is there no way I was asked to say how I felt about the school being named Scales? It is a legacy. I and my family are trying to live up to this because the head of the family led us in this direction and he gave his life supporting education. I am trying to follow in his footsteps because I do believe that as our new president says, that education is the key if we really want to make a better world. And I think that's really what's going on today. So here I am. I can express to you how I feel because I always think about the other half of me. Uh, scales, they refer to him as T90. But if I did not like education, I couldn't have lived with him. <laughs> Sometime I would say, Scales, now we can't do this right now. He said, but Mary, it's about the children. So every time he said that, he thought that everything would really change because he would help families at a time when we had something else to do with the money, but it was always about children. And that's what you're doing here at uh, Murfreesboro City School, and I appreciate what you're doing. I know that it takes an effort on your part. You could be doing other things, but that's what it's all about. So I thought about a little poem that I have hanging on my kitchen. And it says, uh, 100 years from now, it would not matter what kind of car I drove, what kind of house I lived in, how much money I had in my bank account, not what my clothes looked like. But the world may be a little better place because I was important in the life of a child. Thank you. a treasure and she is very active at Scales as is Madeline who is next to Mary and other siblings as well. When Mary's in the building, Queen Mary has arrived. <laughs> they all know her and bow to her. <laughs> a successful school as you know begins with a strong leadership team and I have been very fortunate to have an assistant principal who shares the same philosophy and vision for student success. So I'd like him just to share a couple of words with you as well. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm just going to give a perspective of um, being fortunate to open three schools in my career in, in uh, different roles. And one thing that I didn't imagine that I would get to see was three or four different campuses in 2005 coming together and seeing all the, the diversity and seeing all the different backgrounds coming together. And now four years later, all one big school. And so I, I just appreciate it. And not everybody gets to see that, and I've been blessed to see that, so thank you. We do have a video that we've put together. I would like to recognize all those individuals that are here this evening that are in the video so you can see them, students, grandparents, parents. If you guys would stand, if you were in that video, here they are, here they are. The video is just a way to show you how Scales is an exceptional learning environment 
for children, a welcoming environment for parents and guests, a challenging, nurturing, and positive environment for teachers and staff, and supportive as well. So I hope you will enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Scales Elementary, where superstars shine. Something special that sets Scales apart is the family atmosphere that is so evident when you enter the building. From the photographs of students, family members, and faculty members, to the people that you will see throughout the building and the artwork that is generated by both students and adults. This school really is about celebrating all those within the walls of Scales Elementary and that is indeed what makes this school such a family atmosphere. Once a superstar, always a superstar. Hello, my name is Kayana Barnes. And I am Cameron Massengill. And we are this year's Scale Science Kids. Every week we bring hands-on science experiments to life. All of our episodes include a science definition, an experiment, and a vocabulary word for all the skills students to learn. We then use questions to reinforce the skills that were covered in that episode. The scale student body answers these questions. Winners are selected and then appear in the morning announcements the following day to receive their prize. The science kits were created as a way to spark more interest in science. We also do this by getting as many kids and staff as possible involved in our episode. We choose our topics based on our science curriculum for all grades K through 6. My favorite experiment so far has been when we used our scales rocket to discuss the power of gravity. And mine was when we used our teacher's classroom pets to study animal adaptations. We saw some really cool pets. By the way, all of our episodes are online at the SCALES website under Mr. Priestley's special area page and can be viewed and enjoyed by all, even teachers in other buildings. SCALES Chorus is an after school program that exposes the children to something that they don't get in regular music class. Chorus is compiled of 4th through 6th grade students and is important because it teaches them team building and responsibility. This year the students were given the opportunity to serve our community. They were invited to sing the national anthem at an MTSU basketball game. It did an excellent job. The children love to sing and that's what it's all about. Volunteers are part of the uh, the nurturing and the loving nature of this school, and you can see that in how eager the kids are to see the tutors coming every day. I mean, there's hugs galore from all sides. There's no reward as powerful to me as seeing a kid's eyes grow big when he suddenly gets a big math task in his mind, and watching a slow, shy smile light up a once frowning face, there's nothing like it. We volunteers provide kind of a gateway to knowledge, but we're also models of caring and reliable adult figures and there never can be too many of those so what a delight being a volunteer. We are so fortunate to work with Miss Patty Pearson and Pinnacle Banking <coughs> in our Bank at School program. This program is entirely student-centered. These fifth grade children interview for specific jobs, perform duties weekly, integrate mathematics and communication skills in all their contacts with other students and learn the process of positive interactions and positive problem solving. This banking program teaches children to save money and hopefully develop a lifestyle habit that will follow them into adulthood. We have over 200 students involved in this program and that number grows yearly. Good morning, good morning. I'm with our community star, Mr. Ralph Vaughn. 
The Scales Community Superstar Program is a real example of how a school can be part of a community and a community part of a school. Each week we have a community superstar who is named and interviewed by Ms. Stevens in the morning announcements and then they talk about their careers and they get to visit the classrooms. We began the Community Superstar Program when the school opened and I appreciate as a grandparent that my grandchildren have the opportunity to be introduced to so many careers. As an educator I appreciate the fact that we're beginning early to introduce students to who they can become. As a parent of two children at Scales Elementary, I feel very blessed. The environment at Scales gives all parents a great opportunity to be involved in many areas of the school and encourages parents to participate in PTO, classroom activities, and special events such as our Step Up and Serve fundraiser, the school lock-in, serving at the Thanksgiving luncheon, and volunteering at the book fair and picture day, just to name a few. Scales welcomes our talents and skills to help nurture and inspire our children. I have personally had the privilege of being Starburst, our school mascot, at basketball games and school functions to help promote school spirit. Go Superstar! <laughs> oh, this is the exciting part of the morning. It's time to recognize Shining Stars! He's from Ms. Hookstra's He class. is from Ms. Hook's. Each student at Scales is a star. However, sometimes there are students that are seen shining a bit brighter than the rest. This brightness catches the eyes and attention of teachers and parents. These students could be shining brighter because of super choices, good attitudes, improvements, are just going above and beyond expectations. These shining stars are recognized weekly in front of teachers, parents, and their peers. Here at Scales, we love to celebrate the accomplishments of our shining stars. Hi, I'm Kimberly and I am this year's Student Council President. At Scales, our Student Council membership is made up of 4th through 6th grade students, but all students K through 6 participate in our projects. Some of our projects have been Lucky Grams, Recycling, Canned Food Drive for Family Resource Center, and recently Pennies for Peace where we were able to raise over $1,200. Student Council is designed to give our students a voice and provide them with an opportunity to serve both our campus and community. Five Star Friends is an invaluable part for children with special needs. A typical developing child has the abilities to help and assist a student with special needs to perform a task. Whereas, a special needs child unknowingly assists a typical child in teaching them patience. This is a character building exercise that can change children in a positive way. Five Star Friends helps students learn teamwork, compassion, and friendship that lasts forever. One of my favorite things to do with Five Star Friends is to work with Phoenix. He is one of the students in Mr. Westmoreland's room. We work on knowing letters and numbers. He's really fun to work with, and I look forward to the times that I get to go see. Every Tuesday morning on Morning Announcements, we get to watch an episode of our student newscast. These are filmed every week and are used to inform our students about upcoming events around our school, such as PTO meetings, book fair, jump rope for heart, basketball season, parent university, step up and serve, and many others. I have enjoyed being a part of this program because I know that it helps our students be more involved in our school. A handful of students from the 5th and 6th grade participate in this program as our newscasters. Everyone on the team brings a different personality to delivering the news and keeps the information very fresh. One of the main events at Scales is our one and done Step Up and Serve fundraiser. With this fundraiser, we are able to both raise funds for our school and raise funds for our community. Each grade level adopts a local service agency. Not only are we teaching our children how to give back to their community, we give them the opportunity to serve. Each grade level conducts at least one act of service for their agency. Our children learn finances and action together are needed to make a positive difference in our world. As you know at Scales, it's always about the children. There are many experiences that make the learning environment at Scales a sensational one for both children and adults. And here's just a few more ways in which we motivate children. We take on characters as adults. This is done to motivate and inspire students to achieve success personally and academically. Our children are even afforded unique opportunities as serving as junior principal, yet another motivational tool. At Scales, it is always about the children, and that is what helps to make all superstars shine.
I'd like to take a moment and congratulate Ms. Stevens and her staff on such a wonderful, exciting presentation. And it is always a tremendous privilege to have Mary Scales with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Scales, for coming. And Mary did not brag much about herself. No. I do want to uh, remind everybody she served on our board for eight years and served on the city council for four. We heard about uh, Robert T. 90 Scales. Did not hear very much about yourself. That's that just shows the kind of wonderful character that you are, Ms. Scales. Thank you very much. And our next report is by Principal Barbara Tuxen of Irma Siegel Elementary School. Ms. Tuxen, if you would please come to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. It is indeed a pleasure to represent Irma Siegel Elementary School, home of the Soaring Eagles. <laughs> we will share with you tonight snapshots and excerpts of activities that take place as we educate, as we soar and excel, trying to aspire students to reach their maximum potentials. These snapshots represent activities that's conducted by the greatest professional staff anywhere, by really and truly respectful and responsible students, by caring and supportive parents, and by our terrific staff. So we're very proud of all of them. I would be remiss if I did not say a special thanks to Mickey Brooks and to John Patton, uh, Channel 3 News, who helped to captivate the essence of Irma Siegel Elementary School. And I want to also say a special thank you to Mr. Rich and to Mrs. Dodd, our librarian. And I need to relax two parents tonight, Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, who is the uh, parents of Caroline Taylor, and to Mr. and Mrs. Nedro, who is the parents of John. We start mentorship early at Irma Siegel, and you will see them tonight making their Hollywood debut <laughs> right here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So parents, relax, and thank you so much for sharing your children with us. And they will share with you the uh, presentation that we have tonight. We're ready, Mr. Brooks. My name is Caroline Taylor. I am going to help Ms. Tuxen tell you about Siegel Elementary School. Hi, my name is Jack. I'm reporting from Irma Siegel Elementary. I want to share with you some great things going on at our school. Sit so back, relax, and enjoy. <laughs> At the beginning of each year, we have family fun night. We have games, face painting, food, and so much more, and it is all free. Uh, family fun night is an annual event that we have at Irma Siegel. We usually have it in the fall, around the beginning of the year. And it's a time where we invite out our students, our parents, our faculty, and our community stakeholders just for an evening of free entertainment. We like the fact that it's free. Um, we usually have games and food and just good fellowship for everyone. We are practicing to be anchors for the Siegel Morning News. We begin our day with the news. Each morning at Irma Siegel we do the Siegel Morning News where the sixth graders uh, run the show. We have uh, anchors, copy holders, and a person that does the music and camera. They give the announcements for the day, they do birthdays, uh, any kind of special events in history or any kind of specials that we have on the news. It, they have to work it like a job, they have to be responsible for their position and are required to be here on time. Uh, they have to take it seriously and, uh, and do well in their classes. Our 5th and 6th graders run our student council. They make many important decisions to help our school. Our student council involves 5th and 6th grade at Irma Siegel. Um, we're really more of a service-oriented organization. 
um, the students join student council at the beginning of the school year they have to go through an application process they have an application they fill out and then they also have to write an essay um, they do have an agenda the president has to get me the agenda before the meeting and the secretary has to give me the minutes so we we try to run it just like a city council meeting if it's all possible um, in fact Shane McFarlane came and spoke to them and I think that kind of helped them to kind of get an idea of what it's all about some of the activities that we have done that have been service more oriented we have um, done every year in the springtime we do a shoe drive for one of the local churches they go on a mission trip and they take shoes that we have collected in other places to Appalachia and it is a huge success I think we've collected over the past two years we've collected over 3,000 pairs of shoes we celebrate good behavior with the opening of Irma Siegel Elementary in 1998 it was the desire of the staff to encourage and recognize those students exhibiting appropriate behavior and character traits for good citizenship we have had a character counts program since our school opened including monthly luncheon recognitions we also participated in a three-year grant through Vanderbilt University entitled Love in a Big World for the purpose of encouraging appropriate behavior for living in our society. Character education is a way of life that we want to instill in our students. Each year our parents attend parent class. They love to learn about what these students are doing at school. Each year at uh, Siegel, for the past two years, we've offered um, Parent University, and it's a chance for parents to come in and find out what's going on at school. Um, for example, we offer classes on test taking tips for Terranova, uh, writing assessment, uh, we offer classes on morning meeting, which is something we've incorporated into our classrooms, and we also um, had a class on healthy snacks. There were just numerous um, classes on offered to parents and it's a great time for teachers to interact with the parents. We celebrate Heritage Month in February. Students love learning about all the different cultures. So during the month of February we do celebrate Black History Month and emphasize the contributions of African Americans um, in our country. However, we also celebrate various cultures. Um, our goal is to let students experience hands-on different cultures, um, traditions, different than their own, especially focuses on um, the back, other backgrounds that we have here at our school, um, but also just to help them develop an appreciation for other cultures. Miss Darling Thomas class every year always celebrates the Chinese New Year. It's a holiday that starts on the first day of the New Year, January 1st, and ends 15 days later. Um, throughout that holiday, she will have them have a um, costume dance. They'll actually make the lions out of boxes. They'll have the traditional family reunion dinner. They'll actually sit on the floor barefoot using chopsticks and they'll end the celebration with a lantern parade around the school dressed in Chinese clothing. Irma Siegel has always had an outdoor classroom. We have plants, a pond, and many cool things to help students learn. I teach sixth grade science at Irma Siegel Elementary and I'm going to talk about our outdoor classroom. The sixth grade has used the pond and what we have in the outdoor classroom. Uh, what we've used it for math, we've used it for science, and we used it to uh, train a group to help take care of the pond. They call themselves the Scum Patrol. Um, they they stay after school and and help to clean it up. Uh, we've used it for measuring area. Um, uh, we've also been out with science. Uh, we've been trying to identify some of the plants and the spring coming. We know a lot of plants are going to come back up and things will flush out, so we need to identify the plants. So we've used it that way. This year was our second annual vocabulary parade at Irma Siegel. The third grade classes chose vocabulary words that they depicted during the parade. We encourage the children to be creative, but to use materials that they already had at home. We feel that the children use their imaginations while enriching their vocabulary. We have two math clubs that meet after school. Students learn some hard math and use calculators. I want to talk to you about our special 
math program for students that are high achieving. We have two after school programs for students with high scores in mathematics. Uh, one of those programs is run by Kelly Wilson, who is a classroom teacher here at Siegel Elementary, and it's for third graders and for fourth graders. They meet on two separate days because she's found that it works better developmentally for those groups to be on separate days. Uh, additionally, I, along with a uh, volunteer, uh, Mr. Bill Witherow, who is a substitute teacher uh, here from time to time, are running a fifth and sixth grade math challenge club. Uh, this targets the students with high TCAP scores who are motivated to go even further than the things we can offer them in the regular classroom. Many of our students use exercise balls in the classroom. They help uh, sit up and pay attention. Um, I want to talk to you about a new exercise program that we have at Irma Siegel. We started this program last year um, and what it is are exercise balls that are used instead of the traditional chairs at the students desk. There's lots of benefits that we found to using the exercise balls. Um, part of that would be that it does build your core muscles, um, your back muscles, your abs um, when you're sitting on these because you're having to balance. Um, they've also found that it does improve your balance and your coordination by sitting on the yellow balls as we call them. The Mayo Clinic has actually done some research and found that it burns calories just by sitting on these instead of a traditional chair. So they're thinking that might help um, to fight the childhood obesity. Um, we also found that uh, there's a stimulation that the students get by using the yellow balls um, just from having the sway back and forth or a little bounce in their seat that they'll get the fidgets out um, that they may have if they were just sitting you know, regularly. Check out these science activities. We even have a science club. I sit with the science club after school. We have a group of children that come every week and we break them up into groups and they're able to do hands-on experiments that enrich what they do in class. And we work towards the Science Olympiad, BI, which takes place in April. And it is a competition between elementary age kids that's in a non-threatening, friendly environment. We hope you have enjoyed learning more about my school. This is Caroline Andrat reporting from Irma Siegel Elementary in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Have a great night. <laughs>
when is it appropriate for the board to um, be given information that they are to take back with answers? For instance, there was an item discussed in negotiations two weeks ago. We received minutes of the, the negotiation session, but then they went back to the board with a recommendation on that article and but we weren't given any input so if they're representing us at what point do we give input on those individual items that they're talking about every single week or every session well and any of the other board members can be met at any time I think that I was under the impression as negotiators for this board and it's only my definition, my own, that uh, anything that was discussed, we had entrusted the two that, well, Lee and Gary and whoever else is on this committee, we had entrusted in them to take care of it. Now, I'm pretty sure we've been getting minutes. You get minutes, of minutes. and of course you don't approve the contract mm -mm. until it's brought to you as a total contract. And from time to time, as you read those minutes, you'll find that typically you receive a proposal from MEA and then uh, we respond back at the next meeting. I've received input from various board members, so that nothing prohibits you from giving me a call. Okay, so we can give input. So the the answers it that... It will be given to me. But yes. the answers that Mr. Wilkerson takes back to the teachers are actually your answers or our answers? They would reflect whatever uh, we have studied and reviewed in the law right now. We're doing the entire contract when it comes to salary. I think you all know that uh, I call all of you to find out uh, and, and get input on salary when that time comes. In fact, I think we went to mediation uh, a year, so you certainly know that you've, re you've been allowed to give input. I'm, I'm not sure I know what your question is. Well. All right, say, say tomorrow they talk about an item that we feel uh, maybe they should compromise with the teachers on. Do we let you know that, and then your answer to Lee will reflect? It could reflect uh, a, a single person's. If I find that it's a very strong answer, I would call and ask for input from all the board if there's a differentiation of opinion as to what our typical answer might be on something. So if you'd like to call me privately and talk about this, I would like to do that. Typically, we don't discuss negotiations in a public forum. That is something that uh, we try to... Well, I'm not discussing the details of the negotiation, right, but the process itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just felt like the teachers think that we're giving these answers back to them when we're really not. So I want to make sure if we're being represented that we're having input on every single issue that you answer... To Mr. Well, I think you have given us the authority to uh, respond to them, and uh, I think that's certainly delineated in your board policy. Given the authority to the, the negotiating team or to you? To the negotiating team, as appointed by me, yes. Okay, but you appoint them, but then I think we should have input on what they're going back with the teachers. You certainly are welcome to call me, and I will certainly listen. Thank you. I believe that's a, a negotiations and the negotiating team and is a management function. I can't imagine a, <clears throat> of any corporation in the United States where the board of directors gets involved in the labor negotiations. So I, I think the board should be informed of what's going on and aware of that, but the details of that needs to be left to management, in my opinion. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Phillips. Um, well, that's what my understanding was, was that we um, empowered our negotiating team to work in the best interest of all the parties of the school system. And I know that when I have had a strong feeling about a particular issue, I have always just picked up the phone and shared my opinion with Ms. Mathis. So there's, there's that way, there's that vehicle to communicate. Are there any more questions or comments before we ask for a vote? Mr. Comment. And I, I appreciate Ms. Mathis because I really didn't know how you, how we were how we gave our thoughts to the negotiating team. I don't have a problem with Gary or Lee either one as far as that goes. Uh, they know what what they're doing. The sessions that I have been to, 
I have felt like they have, have done very well professionally. I would encourage, as the Tennessee School Board Association will encourage uh, board members to attend negotiating sessions. Uh, for years, I think it has been felt like that, uh, and for some time, uh, with this, with Mercer City School Board, that board members should not attend. But that's not that's not what Tennessee School Board Association says, as they have uh, indicated on two different occasions and and one through email. Uh, the only thing that I would would like to ask uh, Ms. Mathis or Gary or Lee. Uh, I don't like to be blindsided from somebody. Well, guess what they did to us, or guess what we didn't get, or you know, uh, there's nothing worse than somebody blaming you for something that you don't know anything about. And I think the communication that, that you're talking about, I think that will alleviate that. But uh, when when you gentlemen negotiate, and you're negotiating for all of us, I think. Uh, the communications I think that you send out has been good and I appreciate that so that at least we have a little bit of an idea on what's going on when we're not able to attend. Uh, Dr. Andrews. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that we have a difference of opinion about whether or not we should attend the negotiations and I, um, I did see that it is that the TSBA says legally it is acceptable for um, board members to be there. Um, there have been sessions about negotiations that uh, uh, it was recommended that that we let the staff do that and that we not be um, uh, at negotiations. And I understand there's a dis you know that that we there are different feelings on the board and um, I think it's worked well in the past to let our our uh, negotiators work without our kind of hovering but I, I you know I appreciate there's a difference of opinion on that and um, I guess we'll we'll each you know do what we feel is is best and uh, it has been the the philosophy of this board not to be involved but I you know I there can be a movement the other way looks like there is but that's just my opinion I, I think the way it was done made sense and it's worked well the and I do question. appreciate all the teachers that work hard on on, on the negotiation teams on, for the MEA, and I appreciate what our um, negotiators are doing. It's a tough job, and um, I think we all, in the long run, want what's best for our children, which is generally what's going to be best for our teachers, too. Ms. Duggan and then Dr. Bertram. Bertram. Um, being new on the board and attending training by TSBA, in the original training I received, that was part of what was discussed was negotiations and attendance there. And they did share that they felt it was important that board members on occasion attend a session, uh, one to show support for the board's team and to show support of the teachers and the process that goes on. Um, making it very clear that if you do attend that you are not to speak, you're not to, you know, let on that you're even there really, you know, you should sit back out of the way and not be uh, interference. Uh, now being on both sides of this coin, so to speak, uh, as a teacher in the district, many times I attended negotiation sessions, one just to show interest to the board's team and to show my fellow teachers that I was interested in what was going on. Um, so I have attended once as a board member. Um, I spoke to people as they came in the door and that was the only thing I said during the meeting, just to let them know that we were interested. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with not having faith in our own team because the team was there and on time and ready to get started. But I think that either TSBA has changed their stance on this or, you know, and I thought maybe I misunderstood, so I actually had asked again, you know, did I hear you correctly? But they did say that they would encourage board members to, when they could, to attend just to show support. Well, I was just going to add that just in support of the teachers also, I'd like for them to know our position as board members. So if we might could send something to the teachers from uh, central office saying that the, you know, the board will be involved this way, we uh, are here to hear from them if they need to talk to us. And uh, I just think the teachers should know how involved we want to be and can we be. We want to change our policy? 
Uh, well, let me say this, and certainly I appreciate the board members for their comments and everything they've said. I really appreciate getting some opportunity to, dis to discuss this. I think every teacher in this system is aware of how we feel. I don't want anything to uh, undermine the process. The process, and I appreciate the board members going, those that get a chance to go, go. And those that, you know, maybe something's on your schedule and you can't, that's still good. But let's not undermine the process. Let's let the process work. If the teachers have any comments, I think there's something in place for you to make your comments and if you would like to every now and then maybe express what you feel, let's let it work the way it's intended to work and if we're needed, we're here. We're always here for you. They know that. I don't see sending a, a message out as a broadcast. I think they listen. I'm surprised at how many of them really take the time to sit and listen to our meetings and hear our discussions. So let's let the negotiating team, after we take our vote on it, work. Those that are going, continue to go. And let's see how the process pans out this time. I'm impressed with the communication I've gotten. And let's remember, if you have any suggestions for the negotiating team, please send that to Mrs. Mathis and Carbon uh, Gary uh, Lee. And I, I think you'll get your message over. But let's do our job as board members. Uh, Ms. Ridley? There's a mo we need to get a motion on the floor. What is the motion? The mo I'm I asking for a motion to. Thank you, ma'am. I move that we approve yeah. the negotiations team for 2009-10. Lee Wilkerson and Gary Anderson. Motion, okay. Dr. Andrews, second by Ms. Duggan. Call the roll, Ms. Ridley. Mr. Campbell. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Duggan. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Aye. Dr. Andrews. Aye. Dr. Bertrand. Yes. Ms. Wade. Yes. Ms. Mathis, let's continue. Yes, I am pleased to bring to you the names of 36 individuals that I recommend to be awarded tenure in the Murfreesboro City School System effective June 1, 2009. You'll find their names behind tab 2, and I will read the names that I am recommending for tenure. Julia Barrett, Courtney Brown, Carla Burton, Linda Clark, Doris Coffey, Kathy Crabtree, Siobhan Davis Lewis, <coughs> Leah Fallis, Sarah Gallion, Kimberly Gates, Janice Gilbert, Alicia Johnson, Danielle Kaminsky, Noel Koenig, Brooke LaRoche, Greg Lawson, Karen Lloyd, Tricia Lunty, Christina Maddox, Jessa Mc McDaniel, Ann Montgomery, John P. Orman, Melissa Papella, Tammy Pirtle, Jennifer Polk, Karen Puckett Stinson, Mary Rice, Crystal Roshan, Teresa Rotella, Lori Shea, Amy A. Smith, Shireen Staples, Andrea Summerall, Darlene Thomas, Jennifer Wells, and Lee Wilkerson. And I might ask that you note that I refer to these people as teachers. The law describes or defines a teacher, including uh, teachers, supervisors, principals, directors of schools, and all other certificated personnel. So you will note that there is a principal on this list and there are three central office uh, members. They would, by, uh, by definition of the law, be considered a teacher because uh, the law also goes on and says administrative and supervisory personnel shall have tenure as teachers and not necessarily tenure in the specific type of position in which they may be employed. So I'm recommending these 36 individuals to you to be awarded, to be awarded tenure as teachers in Murfreesboro City Schools. Thank you, Ms. Mathis. Now, this is definitely a milestone in a personnel teacher's or office staff's life. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. There's been a motion and a second. Ms. Ridley, let me back up. Questions? 
Yes, I have questions. I'd like to uh, have the three names of the central office personnel removed from the tenure list for further discussion. And uh, that's not anything personal to them. I, w I would like to discuss their position. And I think we can do that, can't we, Miss Baker? He has to bring it in the form of a motion. It needs to come in the form of a motion to remove their names from the list. Was that a motion, Dr. Buttram? Well, I wasn't aware that it needed to be a motion. I thought we just requested and then we had the discussion. The law requires the director to make her recommendation and the board to vote on the recommendation. As part of the discussion, if you want to make a motion to only approve a certain people, then that's a separate motion. And if you want to discuss certain people, then you need to move to remove them and then have the discussion. Okay. But you don't want to remove by name, am I correct? Right. Well, it's a list of individuals to approve for tenure. Right. And so if there are some of the individuals on the list that the board um, is not wants to discuss before they vote for recommendation, then you would need to make a motion to discuss. I thought you told me that we would just need to request. I didn't I don't think you said that we had to make a motion and that because wouldn't that have to be voted on by the board before those names could be removed to discuss? Yes. Okay, so I just want to request that those three be moved off for discussion. There's been a motion that the entire panel be approved, and in order to change that, we need to request, you need to make that motion to remove individuals from the panel if you don't want to vote on the entire panel. Okay. I guess you, you can, I would assume you... Or you can discuss those, the issue you want to discuss based on the entire panel. Okay. All right. As part of the discussion of the motion that's pending. Let's do that, Mary. I want to make sure by, I have no problem with discussion, but I just want to make sure that I caution as board members, uh, let's keep it as a, just what it is, a discussion. Some things we know are listed on the person that matters we cannot discuss. Now can they, the names have been read, but can they single out names and have a discussion or can the discussion be just without using names or if he has a question about something that may be, he, you don't understand about it. Can we do that? It's my understanding the discussion is relative to positions and okay. not okay. individual names would be okay. used. Okay, we have three three central office management positions that uh, people are filling that are being recommended for tenure. My question was when these positions were hired was it required that they have a certificate? Yes, it was. Their job des description requires them to have a Tennessee teacher's license. Okay. Miss Mathis, you said that it I was said preferred. That that was, no, I said I was not sure without looking up the one that you asked me about. You asked me about Mr. Wilkerson. I said I knew positively in the case of Daniel Kaminsky and Crystal Roshan. But I said I would have to look up Mr. Wilkerson's because I didn't recall whether we said it might have been preferred. I will tell you past history on that job has always required a certificate, but I did not want to answer you inaccurately. I did not look it up at the time. You did not ask me to. But I have since looked it up, and it did require a certificate. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. The, the question, though, is are the positions that are involved, uh, I think we we set ourselves up for having future directors come in and those are positions that they could possibly bring with them or possibly want to fill and, and again uh, I apologize to Ms. Roshan, Ms. Kaminsky and Mr. Wilkerson because this is nothing personal to them but I think that our system uh, should not hire into management positions and then tenure tenure those uh, 
positions because they may not be certified. Some of them are not certified uh, in those positions in central office. But if we set the precedent to tenure those people, then if those positions are dissolved or those uh, people are moved, there may not be a position for them to be moved to. So again, this this doesn't affect their the three people's jobs. They would still have jobs, of course, but I don't think the positions should be tenured positions at that level. Dr. Andrews? I'd like to um, just make a few comments. The precedent has been set for many years, so it's not a matter of setting a precedent. There is a precedent set. The um, tenure is not for the position that they hold. Their tenure is that they uh, will be assured of a job as a teacher or, or another um, higher position in our system unless that we go through the process to deny them their tenure or take their tenure away. So if um, someone came in from another system or we, you know, we got a new director of schools and they decided that they did not want to have a certain person as director of instruction or whatever, then um, what they would do is they can find another spot in the school system and there's always another spot open. Um, you know, there's always a, a, a a teaching position that comes open um, and that that person can move there they may not choose to move to that position uh, but um, that's the way it's been set up I think that um, it's a it's not tremendous job security it's not like you have tenure to to be principal for the rest of your life or, or until you want to retire um, but it does give them a little bit of job security and and the respect that they deserve as um, certificated uh, teachers and um, I think I think they're do that these are um, people who've worked hard to get to the positions they're in and well, they let's not talk about the people though I'm, I'm talking about the positions not the I'm people. I'm talking about it if anyone is in the position that uh, of of in working in the central office, they um, they've worked hard to get there. I don't care who it is, and um, it it's it would not be good for us when we hire people to to put them in a situation where they knew they couldn't get tenure. I, I don't think that would be a, of a benefit. So I'm, I don't quite see where the problem lies. If you can move someone to a different position and bring whoever in you want in. Um, I, I don't see where the problem lies, I guess. What if we, uh, excuse me. Let's try to do this one at a time. I think I had somebody on this side. I tried to catch it. Uh, was someone on this side? Yeah. All righty. Ms. Mathis, uh, my question is, um, the teacher, rec uh, the tenure recommendation as it stands originally, does do any of those positions, does it depart in any way from our practices over the last two decades? I have been with the school system for 25 years and I do know a little bit of the history prior to that and absolutely not. We've always had a license required for our director of instruction. We now call that person the uh, coordinator of instruction. Uh, I know when Dr. Klaus was our personnel director, it was required that he have a license. He was followed by Laurie Crowder. It was required that she have a license. She was followed by Philip Huddleston. It was required that he have a license as personnel director. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I know of, that this certainly um, is our past precedent. Okay. Ms. White. Yes, sir. Well, I, I'd like to make the statement that, again, we tenure people as teachers. Even if they're hired as a principal, we tenure them as teachers. So when you have people in, working in the central office, I'm not sure how they're evaluated. So I'm not sure how they were given the their tenure recommendation, uh, how they would be, or who was on the tenure committee that helped decide this, but I think that we set ourselves up um, for some awkward situations in the future if we uh, tenure positions that have not been evaluated as teachers since tenure can only be granted for or as a teacher. That's all I have to say. Oh, thank you so much. Are there any more comments? I have oh, a question. Do we have some staff in the central office now that are tenured people? 
Yes, we do. Priscilla Van Trees is uh, on the management team, and she is tenured. So we would have, mm -hmm. under this arrangement, we would have some people that were being treated one way and others that were being treated differently. Is That's that correct? And so, uh, uh, Andrews. Um, and, and I would assume that we also have teachers that in the past who've worked their way up through the system who had tenure, and then they have moved into the central office and they re maintain they retain their tenure I'm sure that's happened yeah. I can't Linda Gilbert uh, you know I would well, imagine well, I thank you for that reminder mm -hmm. sitting right in the audience she was sitting in the audience yes as our director of instruction Linda Gilbert had been a music teacher in our mm -hmm. schools absolutely but they were evaluated as teachers before they were given tenure right she would have uh, received tenure already before she came to the central office. As a teacher. But principals are required to have a performance contract. They're not even under the same uh, regulations that a teacher is. And that would hold true for the job description. The job description would uh, delineate or would set out how you would evaluate the person. They can't be evaluated as a teacher because they're not teaching. And let me thank you as board members for giving me the opportunity to try and catch your hands as you want to speak. Uh, it was brought to my attention that it would be better for the audience and the board if I recognized you before you speak so we could stop some of the other conversations going on and know that you have the floor. Uh, thank you Dr. Bertram for your question and all those that had questions and some that had comments. The issue that, and this is strictly uh, my spin on it, we're asked to look at this and either recommend tenure for these folks or deny tenure for these folks. Now there is a policy, Ms. Mathis read that policy. If there are any questions from the board that you want to change a policy, we have the opportunity at any time to have discussion and change policies. But you know the procedure for that is you bring it in this meeting and you're going to read through a few meetings. And, and thank you for your suggestion. That's something we'll need to look into when you're going to change that policy. But right now, we need a motion. I make a motion that uh, we accept our director's recommendation to tenure. We, we are having a motion. Thank you. We had so much discussion last <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. We have a, a motion and a second. Ms. Ridley, please call the roll. Dr. Andrews? Aye. Dr. Buttram? Abstain. Mr. Campbell? Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Wade? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mathis, uh, for carry Yes, on. next is a recommendation on that same sheet behind tab two that you reinstate the tenure of three teachers who left the system and by law, unless you make an exception, they must serve a probationary year and uh, we have three <coughs> teachers who have served their probationary year, the 2008-2009 year, so at the end of June 1, 2009, they will have achieved tenure if you vote to reinstate their tender, tenure. And those teachers are, and I do recommend them, Karen Godwin, Cynthia Hall, and Jennifer Hall. Thank you. Are there any questions for any board members? Any questions for Ms. Mathis or any comments? Hearing none, we'll ask for a motion. So Thank moved. Motion. Thank you. <coughs> second? Was there a second? second? Thank you. Ms. Ridley? You'll call the roll, please, ma'am. Mr. Campbell? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Duggan? Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Aye. Dr. Andrews? Aye. Dr. Bertram? Yes. Mrs. Wade? Yes. Can we have just a... Are you okay? okay. Uh, we need a two-minute break. Okay. A break. A break. Can I get a two-minute break, Ms. Mathis, uh, for a second?
Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Phillips, you had something you needed to say. Yes, I did want to take just a moment and uh, congratulate all our new tenured teachers. Thank them for all their service and what they're going to mean. Ms. Mathis. Yes, your next item, I'm asking for your approval of a revision to our current year's budget, FY09 budget. The revision would be by a net amount of $700,000. This would be to re-roof Black Fox Elementary School. The total cost of the roof we anticipate being $800,000. We believe that we will get $100,000 in a grant from the state, an energy grant, so the net amount would be to revise the budget by $700,000. I provided for you behind tab three a letter written by our architect, Lyle Lynch. He gives you a timetable. He talks to you about how much it would cost per square foot to do the re-roofing. And I've asked him to come tonight. Mr. L Mr. Lynch, if you would come to the podium. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the what I have listed here as an ad alternate. I think we will add that as just a regular amount on the budget, and he will explain that to you. So, Mr. Lynch, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, you for, for waiting so patiently. <laughs> Black Fox Elementary School was built in, I believe it was 1990, and the roof on that building was a 15-year warranty roof, and it's now almost 19 years old, so it's starting to fail and should be re-roofed. Uh, in the process of re-roofing, it has a concrete, uh, lightweight insulating concrete roof deck on it, and that particular deck has to have an underlayment board on top of the concrete before we can put a roof on. And in the process of having to do that, it's appropriate to use inch and a half of insulation board for that particular function, and that increases the R value of the roof and makes it a more energy efficient building. And the staff has determined that there may be funds available to help with this, uh, to help with the cost of increasing the energy efficiency on the building, and that's the hundred thousand dollars. Glad to answer any questions. You may want to go over the schedule just a little bit. Uh, the project schedule when it will be complete and whether it will interrupt children or not I think that's always a critical issue excellent yes um, there's some dates down here on your letter um, the last day of schools which is only a half day is May 29th and at the end of the year uh, per discussions with staff that um, there's some testing going on and so we didn't want any noise or disturbance to the children at the school until May 29th it takes about 90 days to re-roof that school. It's a very large building. Um, and that, as you can see, something we're not uh, real happy with is that it has students returning or scheduled to return August 11th, but it won't be 90 days until August 27th. Um, these operations can be done while students are present. The disadvantages are potential noise on the roof and also uh, the need to keep children away from certain areas. We're planning and have set the contract documents up so that the roofing operations end at the gym in order to facilitate this so you're not disturbing a, an academic class during the time. Mr. Yeah. Lynch, has there been any prior repairs to this roof since it was first the school was built? It's my understanding that the maintenance department has patched this roof, but it's not been replaced. Okay. Was there tornado damage to the roof? Yes, that was the gym, and that was several years ago. But yes, that was uh, that, that was the school, and yes, the the roofing and the edge were uh, were torn off at the at one corner of the gym, and of course the edge and the roof in that whole area that was torn off was replaced. I'm sure. Miss White, I have a question for Miss Mathis. When will we know about the hundred thousand dollar grant? Uh, we, Gary, have you gotten any further information on that? No, we haven't gotten any information yet. We are actually putting together another package because the state has reopened it looking for more grant requests. So they have not given us a time frame yet, so we don't know. Well, how would, how would uh, this affect our, our budget or vote? Say we, we wait, we vote, and then we don't get the grant. Do we have to come back and add a hundred more thousand, or would we be able to find that hundred thousand somewhere else? Should we wait till we get news on the grant before we do this? I guess I feel pretty confident that we'll get the grant, but if we don't, we would have to come back and vote again to take another 100 k from reserve. Uh, and of course, the, the this is just an estimate. 
the bid could come in under budget too, or it could come in over budget. So there are lots of ifs here, and uh, at best we may we would possibly have to come back to you for additional money. Mr. Campbell, I'll, I'll yield to the lady. Oh, okay. Um, I was just looking um, at the schedule, and it looks like we really need to move right along in order to get it started when school um, is out. I'm certainly not opposed to your going ahead and approving moving $800,000 out of reserve uh, because it's certainly nothing that will be spent if it's not needed for this project. So that might uh, be in the best interest of moving forward, uh, Dr. Butler. The same type of roof that's presently there? Murfreesboro City Schools, uh, the new schools have a single membrane EPDM roofs on them. That's what's on Black Fox right now. When Northfield, which is a very similar school, was re-roofed some years ago, a uh, modified bitumen roof was put on there. What, uh, and there's been considerable debate upon how, what materials we use to re-roof this building. Murfreesboro City Schools has buildings with single membrane EPDM roofs and, some, and a few buildings with the modified bitumen roof and we were debating which would be less expensive. What we have uh, set up at this time is to bid it both ways. It's a bid option one and a bid option two. Since the school system and the maintenance department is comfortable with both of those and knows how to repair those and are familiar with them, and uh, it's whichever is the lowest cost. Are there any more questions or discussion? Ms. Duggan. Do you think if we were to have a motion to put forth the 800000 would that in any way have a negative impact on the request for the grant or the grant proposal? I don't think it could possibly. They would not know what our budget is, so I really don't believe it would. Okay. It would just probably uh, facilitate this moving a little bit faster. Does Philip have a question? Is there a roof type that is less conducive to mold and fungus, things like that? Um, I, I don't think that either of these options have exhibited uh, problems with those, not in the Murfreesboro City School System and not on projects that I'm familiar with. If there are no more questions, uh, Mr. Campbell. You're talking about the, the reserve money? Yes. Where is that now? How, how is that? We have a sheet for you right uh, at the end of tab three showing you the way our reserves are at this point. The effect that uh, the $700,000 would have, it would reduce our reserves from uh, four, about $4.9 million to $4.2 million. And of course, this change, if we were to move 800,000, would just make it 4.1 million by the end of uh, June 30, 2009. I, I guess I'm thinking about my own bank account. Oh, where is the money? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have that much. It's not invested in stocks. She sure. may, but I don't. <laughs> where is that 800,000 or 700,000? That's in like a savings, a CD, or something similar. Well, it's not that simple. Some of our money is, but as you can see right now, if you note our ex uh, expenditure and revenue report, we're still actually behind on it. It's just, it's just a bookkeeping entry that we're okay. looking at right here. As far as the real money, we don't get the real money until our budget is pretty much totally complete. So we don't have the real money, whether it's 700 or 800 right now, not today? Not right now, not until our, the rest of our income. I was just going to say, if we yeah. did, I'd say take 700 not take 800 Yeah. Because there's 100 it's, there. You're yeah, get, we would not be breaking a CD or anything like that. I yeah. see where you're coming from. Thank you. <laughs> I think a lot of it's with that Madoff guy in New York. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a check and then back next week. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's your stimulus <laughs> yeah. He made off with it. <laughs> Ms. Duggan. I'd like to make a motion, if it's appropriate, then that we would go ahead and take 800000 and if the bid comes in under that, which I trust it will and hope it will, that way hopefully there will be no delays in moving this forward because I was in a building at one point when the roof was being worked on, and I think we need to do all we can to make sure that it's not being worked on any more than absolutely necessary once the kids are there. I second that motion. Been a motion and second. Uh, Ms. Ridley, please call the roll. I have. Oh, excuse me. I'm still, so I apologize, Ms. Wade. I'm here. still back on the mold and mildew. Not to be um, beating a dead horse here, but I do remember that there was a problem at Northfield with 
um, mold. Was there no there was mold uh, in the building, but not actually mold on the roof itself? That, that there, roof, you may want to address if that. If I can address that, please. There's, um, there's some concern that this is, the existing roof deck is a lightweight insulating concrete roof deck, mm -hmm. and we've had tests on there to test the moisture content on that to see if mold will grow. Mm -hmm. Some of the areas came up positive for water in there, and so we have put some uh, one-way vents and a ventilating base sheet as part of the roofing operation to address that issue. Is that how it was resolved at Northfield? Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Just, I just want to make sure we are doing the very best we can for our kids. Thank you for answering this question. It's really what you call Miss Phillips first. <laughs> Let her get up. Miss Phillips. Aye. Thank you, Miss Phillips. Call the room. Dr. Andrews. Aye. Dr. Bergman. Yes. Mr. Campbell. Yes, ma'am. Miss Duggan. Yes. Mr. Harper. Yes. Miss Wade. Yes. Reports and information. Yes, we have already completed Report A, and Report B is discussion of tuition change for out-of-county students, and I did send you some additional information on that topic in a mailing, and uh, this was an item that was requested to be put on here by Dr. Butcher. Dr. Butcher? Well, I uh, actually brought up this item because a, a citizen of Murfreesboro uh, was talking to me one day and found out that... Uh, we had some out-of-county students attending our school, and I told, told him that they had always been, uh, they had always attended our school, and that we charge a tuition for that. Uh, I believe $900 per family. Um, I think we used to charge a tuition for out-of-city students that lived in Rutherford County of 200, and we dissolved that. But uh, we still charge the $900. I, and I noticed in our board policy that it was our decision or the board's uh, responsibility to review that amount and adjust it if they felt uh, it needed to be. So uh, I believe this has not been changed in how long, Ms. Mathis? Not since I've been with the school system, which has been about 25 years. So for 25 years, we've been charging the same amount. And I know that we all realize that uh, cost of educating children have gone up drastically over the 20, 25 years and um, you know I don't know if 900 is too low uh, but I do think that we need to look at that I think that we need to look at some private schools um, in the area I notice we have a, a headmaster of a private school here tonight we could we could even ask him what their tuition is uh, every year but uh, I do think that with our uh, policy to admit students to our our system that we stand the chance of uh, possibly or setting the policy to to let a lot of students come in and I think that would be a good thing if they come in but still if we're going to use the money of Murfreesboro s citizens to educate children who don't even live in our county much less our city I, I think that this would be an excellent opportunity for us to even get input from uh, our stakeholders, our citizens who pay the taxes, about what they would think. Uh, again, many of them don't even realize we charge tuition or that county student or out of county students are allowed to attend our system. I know there are some systems that don't even allow out of county students in their system. Uh, so I think we need to look at the the amount. Uh, maybe uh, talk to some other people. Talk to. Uh, some entities outside of our school district about this, uh, maybe even speak to the council, Mr. Washington, about um, this item since it does bring revenue into our system. And another thing I just wanted to warn us about was uh, when we have schools that offer special services like our Discovery School, we have to remember that uh, that's almost a private school in itself when you talk, think about the services that are offered to those children. And if we have, uh, you know, theoretically, right now we could have the entire kindergarten class for that school filled up with students from uh, out of our county at a very low cost to attend uh, this wonderful school. So that was my position on that. And again, it was brought to me by several citizens who uh, inquired about that. And I, I know after that happened, Ms. Wade, I, I started asking other people that uh, are citizens of Murfreesboro and taxpayers, and they were, I'd say, uh, maybe one out of ten 
And I asked a lot of people, one out of ten even knew that we received the tuition or allowed those uh, students to come in. So it may be something we want to consider putting on our website. If you'll remember, we talked about putting questions out there. Uh, maybe it could be, should we increase the tuition uh, of the out-of-county <coughs> students from Murfreesboro City Schools? And then they could just answer yes or no. I think that would be a wonderful way to uh, communicate and share with our stakeholders. Are there any questions or comments? I mean, other board members? <coughs> Dr. Andrews and then Ms. Phillips. I'd just like to make the comment that um, I don't have the information in front of me right now, but it's a pretty small issue. Um, um, it's, we, you know, the policy's been the same for quite some time, so I don't see a, a rush for people to bring their children all the way to Murfreesboro from outside of the county. Um, uh, how many people were there, Ms. Mathis? We had 21 out of county enrolled, and six of okay. those children are teachers' children. Okay. All right. And and then I I think that um, the the net financial impact on the district was our best estimate, uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson computed this that we do because of 21 extra children get extra revenue from the state, of course, in the amount of $85,072. And uh, plus the revenue that we get for tuition from the children, which is eleven thousand seven hundred dollars, and then we did dec uh, deduct from that some of the expenses that are direct expenses, such as materials, because we're not actually hiring an additional teacher, we're not paying additional utilities, we don't have any kind of additional overheads, such as extra principals or extra librarians or that sort of thing. So the net amount, a very very conservative estimate is we actually gain, because of having these students, $93,000 per year. And we didn't include in this the weighted full-time equivalent, 88, that we actually received that would make our percent go up of the uh, taxes, which might be another $5,000. But we wanted to keep this a very conservative amount. So we do actually gain by having these students in our schools about 93000 And I do want to address the point that um, we have not filled up the kindergarten. Two, uh, Dr. Butcher may address the Discovery School. Two of the uh, out-of-county children are at the Discovery School in kindergarten. We have one in first grade and one in fourth grade. And I have reviewed to make sure that they did not knock anybody out of a position by being there. We still actually have three spots left this year in kindergarten because we did not have enough students to meet the criteria that we set to actually fill up all those slots. And the same uh, for first grade and uh, my understanding is the same for fourth grade. So I would not want anybody to believe that we would deny a city child if they met the criteria at the Discovery School a spot and fill it with an out-of-county child. No, I, I don't, Mr. White, may I? Well, Mrs. Phillips had and then. I okay. wanted to just finish, if, can I finish? Oh, you're not with I'm sorry, this. she didn't get fin <laughs> finish. Um, I just wanted to make the, the comment um, sort of to finish that um, these are good children and good families with good scores. Um, they bring a lot to our school system, and um, I, I think they're, they're a benefit to our system. So I wouldn't want to do a lot to discourage them from coming, but I, you know, I certainly don't want to see all the children in Lebanon to come here. I don't think that's going to happen, but I thank you very much, Ms. Wade. Thank you. Ms. Phillips and then Dr. Bertram. I had several points. Um, first is I just want to clarify for our audience at home watching. So you're, what you're saying, Mrs. Mathis, is, is that these children coming in bring in um, a net gain to our system, a conservative estimate of about $93,000. That's correct. And then the next thing is um, it's about... Uh, the suggestion that we put it on the website. I never have a I never have a problem with getting input from our um, constituents. My only concern is if there's ever going to be an online question that it be set up in such a way that um, and I don't know if I'm not techni technologically savvy enough to know if it can be set up in such a way or how much trouble it is to set it up in such a way that uh, people are not allowed to go in and uh, just repeatedly vote, 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 vote. Um, and that because that, that's not going to give you any kind of a, of a clear idea of public sentiment. 
And so um, it's what I call the American Idol syndrome, where you just call, 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 call. So um, anyway, the, so uh, you know, my my feeling is that right now the population is so low. Um, basically, I'm thinking of it as 15 um, children, if you're not counting the children of the teachers from out of county. And and if it's not broken, why fix it? Um, if suddenly we see busloads of kids being carted in from from out of county, maybe then it's time to, to look at it. But when we think that these children are bringing us in $93,000 to our system by having them here, and that's a net gain after you subtract their expenses to the system, and we're only talking 15 out of... Uh, what is our population today? 6,902 students. Well, I'm, I'm oh, taking oh away God. the six that belong to teachers. I mean, the, the oh, six. Oh, I'm sorry, of the out of county. Six belong to teachers. Six of those children are teachers' children. So 15. So 15 is what I'm thinking. I didn't hear this part. I'm sorry. You know, I just, um, I just think that as a public relations, um, a public relations issue, it... I don't, would not want it to backfire, suddenly charging more money. You know, I would not want that to backfire. Um, and, but, I, but again, I think the percentage is so low of children from out of county that it's, you know, the point is, at this time, moot. Well, again, I, I don't agree that the point is moot because a citizen actually asked me about this, Ms. Phillips, and uh, whether a citizen chooses to go on to the line and vote one time or a hundred times, it's that's their right. And uh, I don't think we can not share information with them just because someone on the board might be afraid of having an answer come back that they don't necessarily like. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Butcher. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, and uh, in reference to what Ms. Mathis said earlier, it's not the it's not the policy, uh, or it's not the Discovery School um, policy that I was questioning. And again, it was the policy of for the board to be able to increase the tuition if they so choose. Okay. Ms. Phillips, and then uh, Mr. Campbell. I do believe I need to clarify for you, Dr. Buttram, that I am never opposed to the public having information, nor am I afraid of any kind of information being shared with our, our school system that is accurate and true. Uh, Mr. Campbell. Several years ago, uh, we didn't. We did not, or we did, charge people from outside the city. We did two hundred dollars per family. Okay, and then that was increased to nine hundred. No, it, we're talking about out of city versus out of county. We chart. We there. There are two groups of people here. We have a five hundred sixty-one out of city students, and then we have twenty-one out of county, out of Rutherford County. So for a long time, I don't really know how long, we did charge the out-of-city students a $200 per family tuition. And then uh, that was done away with, as uh, Dr. Buttram referenced a while ago. And then we did not do away with the out-of-county tuition of 900 per family. Yes, sir. Certainly I'm appreciative to the comments and the question that arose out of this discussion. And Mr. Hoffa, you have a question? Uh, I may be wrong, but as I recall, uh, I'm not sure it was with you, Ms. Mathis, or not, but uh, I had a meeting with the mayor and the city manager, and the out-of-county tuition was raised slightly at that time. And as I recall, I think the thought was that they we would kind of estimate what an average homeowner would pay in real estate taxes and I believe that's how we arrived at the $900 per student. So if these out-of-county parents lived in Murfreesboro, they would be paying city taxes of approximately $900. So the city was being compensated or, uh, in that manner. Uh, so I think that the taxpayers need to be aware that these we do have 15 students who are not teachers' children that are attending the city schools, and if need be, I'll read the 
There's two at Black Fox. There's one at Bradley. There's four at Case and Lane. There's two at Irma Siegel. There's three at Hobgood. There's one at Mitchell Nelson Primary. There's one at Northfield. There's four at Discovery School and three at Scales. As far as I know, there are seats available without overcrowding or taking the children's spaces there. And by having the services already been provided, uh, if you have a vacant seat, you aren't getting the revenue from the state where if we have these people coming uh, to our system and aren't overcrowding us and we have space for them, then the school system realizes extra revenue. So uh, with that explanation, the mayor and city manager were comfortable and uh, I have been to City Hall on many occasions asking for money for the school board and I assure you that they take all of this very seriously and I assure you, you don't want to go to ask for money. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I feel comfortable with what we're doing. I'd like for people to understand and know what we're doing and uh, I'm glad we can answer the questions for people who might be asking about it. It's nice for them to know. Ms. Wade? Yes, sir. Uh, I like Mr. Hopper's idea about the, maybe if we could find out what the average tax homeowner in Murfreesboro City pays, just on the average, what would be their property tax, uh, and maybe bring that back to the board and see how close we are, if that's how they calculated this number. The portion that goes toward education, is that what you want? No, I'd like to know, I think Mr. Hopper said, was it the average tax, city tax that the homeowner paid, Mr. Hopper? That goes toward education, that's what the study had been. I would have to try to recall exactly. I remember that conversation with the mayor and the, and the city manager, and I, I would just have to, well, it, I don't recall close more definitely than that. Mr. Campbell. It should not be difficult to find out the answer to both questions. What the average homeowner is paying in taxes, and then when you find that, you're going to find out what percentage is going to education. So you get one, you get them both. Are there Am any I other right? questions? Well, there, there is a ramification other than just what the city, what those people are paying to the, because we're getting money from the state yeah. to, to pay for uh Pay for those children. But too, I so. think where he was coming right. from was that when you said that it was based on the average tax. So if we get, if we get, yeah. if I know how much you're paying in property tax, I know how much of that's going to education. So one figure, do it all. I'd, I'd like to make a motion, Ms. Wade. May I? Is there any more discussion? Anything anybody would like to ask? And um, we will entertain a motion. Mm -hmm. Um, in the interest of uh, so that parents can know what to expect over the next year, um, I'd like to move that we leave tuition where it is uh, for out-of-county students. Is there a second? I think they need to know. I'll second the motion. We've had a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Ridley, did you get that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you call the roll, Ms. Ridley? What about the no, uh, back up qu uh, questions? So, why wouldn't we wait to get the answer to these questions that might cause us to increase or possibly to de decrease? Well, I don't understand why we need to make a motion tonight, and can we do that now, Ms. Uh, Dr. Andrews? It was on the agenda to talk about it. So. Yeah, but it's not its not an action item, is it? It's not listed under action items, but the board at any point can make a motion to to deter, to, to decide items. We, okay, I thought earlier Dr. Andrews said something about the agenda and not being able to do something. but That's for the consent agenda. agenda. Okay. They're different, right. yeah. Let me say this before you speak, uh, <laughs> Mr. Campbell. I think we as board members have big hearts. We're very concerned about the economy, uh, what's happening to uh, parents, and the uh, situation that we're in right now. So I think, th and I'm hoping that's why Dr. Andrews made the motion. I'm hoping that's why uh, Dr. Buttram is looking into it for future years. 
but I don't want any parents tonight or teachers that are listening to have children in our system to feel like we're trying to shove another burden on them. That's not what we're doing tonight. We're just at the wholesome discussion. There's a motion on the table, but first, uh, let Mr. Campbell. I'd like for us to, to wait to when it, this is March, April. If parents know by April whether or not that is going to increase from 900 or decrease, it's not going to make that much difference. But I really and truly think that before we put something in concrete tonight, that if if it is a matter of concern, and everybody just about has, has had a comment, one more month is not going to make any difference, I don't think, because it's it's not going to take but one phone call, I don't think, to call the city government and the tax people and find out how what the average property tax is, and then if education is getting seventy five percent, then if it's a thousand dollars, then you know seven hundred and fifty is going to education and bingo. I have a question, please. I know we don't wait till the last minute to make or send out any information for parents on when the uh, tuition is due or whether or not they're planning to return to the school system. That's just a question I have. Have we sent out anything or have we done anything uh, for the parents at the schools that are affected with this uh, tuition for the next school year? Have well, we sent yeah, out? Yes, we have. And as you all recall, I, I shared with you some minutes reflecting um, comments that Dr. Clark made as far as that school. Uh, she had all her plans in place, and you had asked then, Mrs. Wade, that we wait until the 2009-2010 school year to make any decision on any tuition changes because of plans that parents might have made. And we had included in the packet sent to you the list of enrollment events, and basically we have put uh, newspaper ads in for uh, all of the schools that would accept out of city, out of county, uh, and that it's basically any assignment is made based on space available. And of course, we did announce our tuition amount of nine hundred dollars per family for out of county. All righty, uh, Ms. Duggan, and then Dr. Andrews. I would just like to ask if Dr. Andrews would consider amending her motion to say for the 2009-2010 school year and then it can be addressed again during next school year if we feel like it needs to be. Um, I, I can comment on that. I, I, we could do that. Um, I feel like a month is a long time for a parent who, who hasn't been worried up to this point and may become worried now. Um, I also feel like there's not there's not a large, it's a very low, very, very low percentage of our budget that we're talking about. We've spent a lot of time um, discussing it, and I, you know, I don't think what we're going to hear from the city is going to, you know, that may have been the way the decision was made back then, but, you know, when it comes down to it, we just decide, okay, is this fair? Is this reasonable? Are we getting... Uh, getting way too many children because it's so so cheap or are we not getting any because it costs too much I, I feel like we're at a comfortable spot with it so um, I'd, I'd rather not have to go through this again um, every year um, I'd like to talk about I'd like to spend our time talking about what's uh, what's helping our teachers in the classroom what's making our schools work uh, um, you know, where can we come up with the money to get the programs going that will help us uh, be a, a success? So, um, I, I guess I just sort of like to see us get this resolved and and move on to things that I see as uh, being um, quite important. But I, you know, I, I, I can I can accept that. I'd, I'd rather not. But um, if that would help us move on tonight, I guess I can accept that. Um, anyone, my second, have a feeling on that? There's one more question. Oh, okay. Do that. Mrs. Phillips. Um, they may, this may not seem pertinent, but how much is the cost of a bus? About 80, 80 to 100000 So when I see that $93,000, I see that pays for a bus, and that's what I thought it was. You know, I mean, not that we're going to buy a bus, but I'm just, I'm just thinking, what will that $93,000 purchase mm -hmm. for our kids? 
And so. I, but I'm thinking about the difference between what we might charge. You know, if we charge a thousand dollars next year, right. it's not going to be. It's not going to make a, a huge difference in our budget. Uh, it might make a fairly big difference to those families. Um, uh, if, if we double it, that will make a huge difference to some some families. Um, you're, were you my second? I was. You were? you were. Okay. I don't care to change my second. Okay. I guess I'll just leave it where it is then, Ms. Duggan, but I, I appreciate that. Not a bad idea. There is a mo Ms. Wade, yes, but we could, I mean, next year, if we decide to increase or lower the tuition, we could we could do that. So, I mean, once mm -hmm. if we set it tonight, it's not set forever. It's not set for one year. Um, I think that's the board's responsibility to review its policies every year and it said make that decision. So I wanted to make that clear. Dr. Andrews, um, what would, if you don't mind restate your motion, what was your okay. motion? I move that we leave out of county tuition at $900 per family per year. And it's the second. Ms. Ridley, Caldwell. Dr. Becker? No. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Ms. Duggan? Yes. Ms. Hopper? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Dr. Andrews? Aye. Ms. Wade? Yes. Ms. Mathis? Yes, just have some information for you on a personnel update. We do not have any information to report on our 90 day people, but behind tab four, just wanted to keep you informed of those teachers who have been recommended for advancement to a professional license and this will be upon completion of the 2008-9 uh, school year. There's no approval, it's just for your information to keep you aware. Uh, next would be may your I monthly... It, just make a comment. Sure. Nancy usually does this. May, may I make the comment? Just <laughs> congratulations to these <laughs> teachers who've gotten their professional license. It's just, it is. it's a big step. They've worked hard to get where they are. And they really have. Very definitely. And behind tab five, you will find our <coughs> monthly revenue and expenditure report. This shows us through 67% of the budget year. And we're still showing a negative amount of $166,000. Actually, the city is slightly behind on its allocation, just the way we have it recorded. And had we gotten that extra 400000 we would be in the black. And I know that would make Mr. Hopper very happy to see that. So we're doing quite well, and thanks to Gary and everybody working with him, making sure that we are keeping our expenditures in check and our revenue is still coming in pretty much on target. And your last report is your attendance report behind tab six. This is for your sixth month of attendance. We have 6,902 students in K through six, and this is an increase of 10 over last month. So after having an increase of 27 last month, we increased another 10 this month. So we do continue to grow. And in addition to our K through six students, we have uh, 368 K children for a total enrollment of 7,270 students. And those are all the reports. We're down to other business. Is there anything? Is this, is this where we ask for the next meeting? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. I would like for us to, uh, I'd like to request that we put the uh, Jameson subdivision item on the agenda as an action item next month. I'm going to make a special meeting uh, with just Mr. Campbell and I uh, to talk about it. Um, I'm trying to Under other business, the only thing about this is we just finished with rezoning. We're not into rezoning right now. We're finished with rezoning. Now, if you'd like to do some more rezoning, 
I think that's when we can add rezoning back to other business. But right now we've rezoned two schools. This was not one of the spots that we rezoned. We have already previously rezoned Jameson Place. And uh, Mr. Kemba, I, I, I just don't know and I, I just don't know how to, whether we want to get back into rezoning again. We're not into rezoning anymore and I hope I've got this right, but I thought that we were finished with rezoning unless we build another school. And we had rezoned Jameson Place a good while ago. And if you get back into rezoning, you're, we're going to have to open this up to every street and subdivision we've rezoned in the last two, three, or four years. And I don't think, I, I can't speak for anybody but myself, but I can't imagine revisiting all those neighborhoods again when we're not even into rezoning. I'd like for you to think about it. And because um, I can't imagine what more we could say or do uh, to the subdivision other than we're just not into rezoning. And that is a rezoning issue. So are you, <laughs> are you telling me we're not going to put it on the agenda? Mm -hmm. We'll put it down, Mrs. Mathis, and I'll get with Mr. Campbell and uh, talk about this. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else anybody would like to put under the business? I'd, yes, ma'am. I'd like to request that we go ahead and start looking at dates for maybe a day and a half retreat. Because um, even like the rezoning issue, I feel like that I, for one, wish we could have had more in depth conversations about the rezoning. Um, and that's not to say that we. You know that Mr. Anderson he did a great job with you know preparing the plats and showing us all that. Um, but I would I would personally have liked to have had more discussion with the board on some of those issues. But I would like to for us to go ahead and start maybe looking at some dates for a retreat. So you're thinking of a day and a half retreat? So because that yes. could go on the agenda. Yes. Then. Mrs. Okay. Mathis, would you please? Uh, yes. Thank you. And Ms. Wade, I have uh, a request for a report. I would like uh, to have a report on our homeless population and what we're doing with them. I know we, we've identified uh, several children. Uh, I think if, if many of you have, may have heard this week that uh, the federal government has offered a stimulus uh, package specifically for identified homeless children. I'd like to know if we applied for the McKinney-Vento Act uh, monies. Uh, you know, just a, re a report, maybe have Candy Clifford come in and talk to us about the programs where she's serving those children, because I know we we have a lot of those children identified in our system, and that would be something uh, I think our citizens would like to see uh, how we're working with them. So basically, you're asking for a report from Ms. Clifford? From Ms. Clifford on the uh, our homeless children, and uh, then I may possibly Ms. Kaminsky on the uh, McKin McKenna McKinney Vento monies and the, um, the stimulus money for uh, that, I think, is for this year, actually, depending on how many students have been identified. Is there any other? business for next month's agenda. Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? You can just call it. So moved. You can just do it. Is there a second? Second. second. The meeting is adjourned.